Refuge Online, thank you for joining us today. Man, today I stand in front of our new home. Uh, a building that is going up. We believe that we're living in exciting days that God is doing, come on, something incredible within our house. Thank you to all who are making this possible. Today, we're going to kick off with our Refuge Kids worship team. We believe you're going to enjoy this. Grab your children, get them in front of the screen. Let's worship together as our new home literally goes up. We're coming together to worship. We'll be back, but let us pray. Jesus, I pray that you bless this service. We know that it's going to be incredible because you're here. We give you all the praise. Come on, all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, somebody shout, amen. Let's worship. Come on, it's that time, a minute to share. Amazing Grace, Techno Style is gonna come on. There's gonna be 60 seconds on the clock. Matthew Burnett, all the way from, from Los Angeles, California, the Dream Center is with us today. Get the word out, let people know. Come on, ready, set, share.
I'm back with one exciting announcement for you. Come on, you can hear the honking behind me, but this is real life out here. We're building and we're out here by the building, but one exciting announcement. Come on, Refuge Kids, this is for you. We want you, we want your friends, we want your cousins at our summer camp online on Refuge Facebook page this Saturday at 10 a.m. So I want you to invite your friends, invite your cousins, invite your parents to come out and join us in what we would believe will be a time that you encounter Jesus in a new way. Come on, somebody give me the thumbs up, the heart, that little teddy bear thing on Facebook if you're excited about this Saturday at 10 a.m. Before somebody honks, I'm going to jump in to our giving part of service. Man, if you're a guest here, know this, no pressure to give. We're just glad that you're online at church. This is for refuge people who call the church home, and we're building a new building to bring more people to the family table. I want to encourage you and let you know that everything that you're giving in our Heart for the House offering is going to, and you can see the progress, to this building that stands behind me that will reach people for Jesus. We believe that drug addicts, we believe that prostitutes, we believe that the lonely, we believe that people who do not know Jesus are going to meet Jesus in this building through your giving. So as our worship team gets ready to come and they're going to lead us in a time of worship, I'm going to pray. God, I pray that you bless our giving today. Bless every person who's watching, God. Bless our church. Come on, God, bless San Antonio. Heal our nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, somebody in their living room, kitchen, car, wherever you're watching from, shout amen. Your 
up and we give you glory and praise. Thank you, Jesus. Refugees, it's my highest honor to introduce to you today's guest at Refuge Online, Matthew Burnett, who is known all over the world for launching the Dream Center. You're gonna enjoy today's message. Come on, make Pastor Matthew welcome as he preaches here in San Antonio, Texas. Hello, Refuge Church. This is Matthew Barnett from the Dream Center, and I just love your pastor so much. Pastor David and Jackie, thank you so much for all that you mean to us here at the church, and God bless you for all the work that you're doing there in your city and the difference that you're making. And this is my own message just for you guys, just for your church and congregation. I just pray that during this time of uh, watching sermons online that you'll get something out of it. I, I know that you will because I know what your heart is. Your heart is to make a difference in your community and to serve your generation. And we just love you. I never forget when your pastor came to the Dream Center and he had a chance to sit in service and He's just such a delightful person. I mean, anybody who would do penalty kicks for 24 hours to raise funds, I told him that's way harder than shooting free throws. I shot free throws for 24 hours, but imagine being a goalkeeper for 24 hours. I mean, come on, that's pretty incredible. So congratulations on your amazing courage. And I know that when you're working um, in ministry of outreach, it just takes that kind of heartbeat to do it. And I love you and I praise God for you. And we're gonna have a great service here today. So it's good to be with you in your uh, state of Texas and ministering here from California, this landmark building, Angel's Temple, where we have our services where I get to deliver a customized, message just for you. I'm going to speak to you this morning on the subject of the beauty of hitting rock bottom. The beauty of hitting rock bottom. You'll say, there's nothing beautiful about hitting rock bottom. That's usually kind of a place that we say people have to go, like the end road. But I want to talk to you about how God uses rock bottom for his glory. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I'm going to tell you, how those 12 words and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path, how those 12 words literally change my life. Let's pray. Father, I ask you as I deliver this message on going to rock bottom that you would allow us to be rebuilt during this time that we're in. The season that we are in, that it seems endless. The fatigue seems endless. The weariness seems endless. But Lord, I pray right now you would anoint us to have the second wind of your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. At the age of 20, I came to Los Angeles to pastor a church. I was actually, uh, well, not even on the list to be pastors because my dad received a building in the middle of the inner city of LA to take over a church that was about ready to be sold by the Assemblies of God and needed one last chance to be rebuilt back to life. Well, I'll never forget, I was 20. I just went with my dad because that's what I did. I went, went with him everywhere and he was trying to find a pastor. So he puts a bunch of candidates in a van. It was driving around the neighborhood, around the Dream Center. It was a little old church uh, on Sunset Boulevard that was really surrounded by heavy gang activity during that time. And these pastors were tricked a little bit by my dad. They thought, man, LA, Hollywood, we're gonna build a church. And when they saw the neighborhood, every single one of them said, I don't feel led of the Holy Spirit to come and pastor this church. So I was literally 20 years old. I was 11th on the list of 10. I wasn't even considered. I felt like David, the little shepherd boy out there in the field, not even know that his time would be called. And, and when I went home, every one of them turned it down. My dad got so discouraged. He says, son, I can't find anyone to take over this church. But he said, uh, would you come and help me for three months, pastor the church until I find a real pastor? And uh, so basically, I was only supposed to be there for three months. And now it's 26 years later in downtown Los Angeles, and I'm still pastoring after all these years. We're still looking for the real pastor. Maybe I'm preaching to it right now, and you'll rise up and take over my job. All right. But it was a, it was a very challenging time. I was 20. I came from a mega church of thousands of people. And the first week I got there, I was all excited. I said, man, I'm going to preach my dad's greatest sermon. So for 10 weeks, I preached Tommy Barnett's greatest hit sermon. But there was a problem. There was a week 11, and there was a week 12, and there was a week 13, and I ran out of sermons, and I got so frustrated becoming from this big old church, and yet looking out and not even one person showing up on a Sunday night for one of my services, not even one. 
And I'll never forget looking out that little window of my office, hoping that somebody would show up. You know, would one person show up, please? And, and somebody would walk by the church. I'm like, well, thank God we can have a service. One person's here. And then I realized that they were walking to the liquor store next to the church instead of the church. And, and it was so discouraging. And I went to my apartment one night. And I was in a place of rock bottom. I was in a place where I thought no way in the world could I ever get any momentum in this city. And I cried on my pillow for like three hours. And in the middle of my tears and weeping, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to stop your crying. I want you to do a prayer walk around Echo Park. Now, back then in the 1990s, <laughs> Echo Park was was one of the toughest communities around. And so when God told me to do that, I thought God was mad at me and for being a big old baby and was just going to finish me off in a drive-by shooting. I mean, that's what I thought was really going to happen. And so I got up and I took a prayer walk around Skid Row, L.A. I took a walk around the park. And when I saw that day in the park were needs everywhere. I saw homeless people that were sleeping in the park. I saw helicopters that were looking for people that were homeless, that needed help. I, I looked around and I saw all this need and God spoke to me a word that changed my life. He said, from this moment on, I want you to die to your dream of being a success. And I want you to live to the dream of being a blessing. I want you to live to the dream of providing a place for that homeless man to stay. I want you to live to the dream of, of those young men up against police cars being arrested, of having something in the community there for them that will last and stand the test of time. I want you to build a 24-hour church in the middle of a 24-7 city. And it was that day that my dream went to rock bottom not so that it could be destroyed because God never destroys you or I or any of us in rock bottom. Could it be that sometimes we have to go to a place of rock bottom, not so that we can be destroyed, but to realize that God doesn't destroy people in rock bottom. He recreates people in rock bottom. And right now, in the middle of this, what you're going through right now, God is in the process of recreating you. That is something that only the valley and trial and loss could do. Instead of cursing the fact that you're in the valley, why don't you rejoice? Because God is taking you through something to get to something that's far beyond anything that you could ever imagine. God is about to rebuild you and God began to rebuild the ministry. I went back to my church and I used to preach closing my eyes because I, I, I wanted to see the glory of God. So I would preach with closed eyes during that time because I didn't want to see what was in front of me. I wanted to see the possibilities beyond the scattered uh, people in the crowd. And I began to see miracles happen and a house opened up and we took in people and, and uh, started a drug and alcohol rehab program, even though we had no idea how to do it. We started using every space we had for outreach. We had an old dirt lot and I bought a Kmart basketball hoop and we turned it into a community basketball center in that old dirt lot with those cheap Kmart basketball hoops and uh, those old kind of weight pile that, you know, the weights at Kmart that you would buy that if you dropped them, they were made of concrete and 10 pounds, which turned into like 9.5 pounds, you know, and uh, we bought those and turned away pile and, and gave people a little wall to have their graffiti and all that and their art expression and, and God began to turn that neighborhood around. We had two houses and three houses of people who were being rehabilitated and we outgrew that entire neighborhood. It's funny. I went from trying to be a success to a failure, but then I lost myself and rock bottom into the purpose of helping others and begin to realize that God's dream of success was greater than my initial plan. God's broken, your broken plans in the hands of God are greater than your perfected ideas from the beginning that oftentimes were never in God's heart or never in God's plan anyways. God is right now rebuilding you, Refuge Church. He's rebuilding you who drove uh, to church this morning. I don't know if you're driving in California. We've been locked down forever, but whether you're watching this or you're driving or you're watching this live, God is is recreating you wherever you're at in your home, in your car. Let him do something extraordinary and rock bottom because that's always where God does his greatest work. One day I'm driving down the freeway, I look to my right, I see this big old hospital on the Hollywood freeway. 400,000 square feet. One of the largest hospitals west of the Mississippi. Celebrities were born here. Movies were filmed here. Nightmare on Elm Street was filmed here. And uh, every horror film of, of the 1990s, pretty much in the 80s, were filmed here. Halloween. We had to pray every demon out of this building. You know, eventually we got it. But uh, I saw that hospital over the side of the road. And it was incredible. And I looked at that building. 
And I saw it, and it said for sale. So I pulled over to the side, and I drove in, and I saw the uh, the, the people that were meeting in there, and, uh, and the office, uh, a film company had taken it over temporarily, and they were filming movies there, but they were getting ready to sell the building to Paramount Studios. And I walked into the building as a 22-year-old kid, and our church was starting to thrive. We were starting to get people into the building. And I wasn't even thinking about the word success. We were just serving and loving people, and people were showing up. And I'm walking into this big old hospital. I'm 22 years of age. I said, I'm interested in buying the building. How much is it? They kind of looked at me and laughed and said, no, uh, this is already going to be sold to Paramount Studios. And we already have an offer on the table. And you'll ask me, what did you do when you heard that? Well, I looked to my left. I looked to my right. I looked at the security guard that wasn't paying attention, and I snuck in the building, and I gave myself a tour of the building anyways. How many here know when God gives you a dream, sometimes you got to go gangster for Jesus, right? And so I'm walking around that building illegally with one eye on Jesus and one eye on the security guard that was trying to get me, you know? That's why the Bible says, watch and pray. you got to get a dream and run from the cops sometimes, right? And I'm, I'm going up that 15-story hospital building, and I get to the rooftop. And as I'm looking out over that massive campus, the Hollywood sign over here, Dodger sign, uh, Stadium right over there, and I looked at this massive nine-building, 15-story hospital building in the campus, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, the pimps are working 24 hours a day. The adult film ministry preying on runaway kids, they're working 24 hours a day. If they can work 24 hours a day, how about having a church that will be open 24 hours a day where every hour of the day somebody would be living in the building, every hour of the day a homeless person can be taken care of, every hour of the day a prisoner can be led into the house of God, every hour of the day a homeless veteran would have a place to go. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to build a 24-hour church right here in a 24-hour city. We went to the Catholic Church and we talked to them who owned the building and said, look, we don't have $16 million like Paramount has, but we have a dream. And, uh, and we told them what our dream was. And, uh, and they, they, they asked me to, um, to make them an offer. And we couldn't believe it. I talked to my dad. And uh, we, they said, they want us to make an offer. I mean, they're actually moved by what we want to do in the community. As we talked to the sisters about the vision, my dad looked at me, I looked at him. We showed up to the meeting and we said, they said, make us an offer. We said $3.9 million. We had no idea. It was just the first number that came to our head. And they accepted our offer for $3.9 million versus a $16 million offer. And now for the last 20 plus years, we've been in this hospital housing hundreds of people every single day, uh, hundreds of people coming off of drugs and alcohol. I mean, we got ex-murderers in our church. We got ex-pimps. And that's just a pastoral staff. That's not including everybody else we got going on in the church, you know. But hundreds of people whose lives are being restored. Every single day, families, veterans, emancipated minors, trafficking victims, people that need shelter, all in a building every single day. And can I tell you, my dream had to go to rock bottom of being a successful pastor, of having a big congregation. All that had to die in order for the vision to come alive. There is beauty in rock bottom. There is beauty in your low point in your life. There is beauty in the struggle that you're going through. There's a time that we're all dealing with right now in a America, but this is not a time that we go into a place where we fall apart. This is a place that we go for God to recreate us in our job, in our business, in our parenting, in every aspect of our life. We go to rock bottom and we bounce off of rock bottom and we are recreated in rock bottom. That's why David said, thank God for broken bones. He didn't say it as he was going through the breaking in his body. He didn't say it when he was going through the betrayal of his own son. He didn't say it while he was going through all the, the, the battles of his life. But as David looks back over his life, he said, the very thing that was meant to break me was the very thing that made me the kind of leader that I became. Thank God for broken bones. Samson was in rock bottom. They thought it was over. They brought him out every single day as a little party, a little party joke because they wanted to mock the former great man of God. And so they would bring him out when the, the alcohol was starting to die down. They needed to up the party a little bit. So I got an idea. Let's get old Samson over there, that former great warrior. Let's bring him out. Let's have him do a few tricks and push on a few walls because we know he's going to fail. And it remind us of how the great one has once fallen. So they would do the same thing every day. They would bring him out. And Samson, again, they gouged out his eyes. And, and he was powerless. He couldn't do it. His hair was cut, so he lost his power. But there's, there's a scripture that it says in the Bible about Samson while he was in prison. 
but the hair of Samson's head began to grow again. I wish that was for me. But anyways, the hair of his head began to grow. What was happening in that place, in that prison in Rock Bottom, is something was going on behind the scenes. There was a Samson that was coming forth, that was getting ready to rise up, to do great things. There was something that was there. His hair began to grow again. And can I tell you, no matter what you're going through in Refuge Church, no matter what you're going through as a member, no matter how much the leadership is going through struggles during this time, as we are everyone, there's no way around it. In the time that we're living in, the world doesn't know it, but the hair of our head is starting to grow again, Pastor. It, Pastor Dave is starting to happen. And, well, Jackie, you got great hair, but and Pastor Dave, it's starting to happen with you, right? God's about to do something, and, and, and Samson was pulled out again. Let's mock him one more time. But the last time they tried to do that, Samson put his arms around those pillars, and he pulled them down, and he did more in one feet at the end of his life after failure, after the mistakes he made, than all the great wars he had won before. He was able to do his greatest feat at his lowest point. Why? Because God was still doing something in his life through rock bottom. And God is still moving in your life no matter what you're going through. Right now, he is on the move. Every day I look at that hospital, I think about that ministry, then the Dream Center, and the hundreds of homeless people that come through that building who are changed, the hundreds of people from the judges that are sentenced here, the cops that pull up, and they bring people from rock bottom. They literally bring prisoners in chains to our building who have nowhere to go. Can you imagine that, bringing them in chains to the Dream Center? And they pull up and say, would you take this person in? And they have to uncuff them as they check into our rehab program. I don't look at that criminal and say, boy, what a horrible person. I wonder what he did to put him in this situation. I wonder what he did to show up in that police car all locked up. What I see is when they check in the police into our recovery program, I see the beauty of what's about to happen in rock bottom. I see the person that, that he's about to become. I see all that misplaced passion in the wrong direction now being put in the right direction to be used mightily for God. I don't see pain that is wasted. I see pain that is being redeemed for the glory of God. I'm telling you, sometimes you think it's the worst season of your life. You think it's all coming to an end just when you think it's over. God can do something so extraordinary to let you realize it's not over. It has really just started. Life begins at rock bottom. God doesn't destroy anyone in rock bottom. He recreates them. And God is about to recreate you today. All things are possible to them that believe. Don't lose hope. Don't lose fire. The Bible says, a smoking flack he shall not quench, which means as long as there's a little bit of smoke left on that stick that you can give God, there's a chance for a mighty fire to begin to burn again. As I look at 26 years of that hospital, I look at the six months nearly, we're approaching about six months of lockdown California has been under. People say in the natural, there's no way in the world that you guys can survive. How in the world are you keep going during this time? How'd you feed a million people in the drive through line as 11 hours a day, seven days a week are getting food? All of this, because we've understood that rock bottom doesn't mean that you're at the end of an era. It just means that you're in the beginning of a new phase that God is about to use. And keep your head up. Stay encouraged. And I know it's so difficult to get discouraged. I visit there often. But may you win more battles than you get discouraged and rise up from rock bottom and realize that God is creating something in you that only the valley can create. He's about to do something great in you. The first day I came to L.A., I was 20 years of age, like I said. Back then, I was skinny. When I stuck out my tongue, I looked like a zipper. I was so skinny back then, you know. And I was 20, but I looked like I was 12, like the kid from the Home Alone movie, right? And uh, that's what I looked like back then. And so when I showed up to L.A., I didn't know any idea what to expect. My dad asked me to come for three months, like I told you earlier. I was just there thinking, hey, this is going to be a short period of time. And the first week I went there, there was a young man that was shot and killed in a drive-by shooting right there on the steps of the church. I literally had to walk around a boy that was shot to get to my first church service. Can you imagine that? As I walked into a midweek service with all the elderly congregation members that were left, just maybe a dozen that were left, and I got together with them and I said, look, I know I'm supposed to introduce myself as a new pastor, but I don't think I can preach to you. I don't think I can talk to you really and do a Bible study now because there's just something not right about walking around a boy that's been killed to preach my first sermon. I think we ought to cancel the service and go across the street and give some money to the family to let them know how much we love them. 
They said, Pastor, you don't understand. You're new to this neighborhood. The gang members, they stick to themselves, and we, the, the church people, we stick to ourselves. I said, oh, okay, we have our gang, and they have their gang. I said, but you know what? Let's just go over there, and let's bring them an offering, and let's just see what God might do. Who will go with me? And I asked them, and they, no, nobody raised their hand. So instead, they gave me a little offering of $38, and I couldn't get a volunteer, but they did give me that money, and I went across the street to an apartment attached to a liquor store. I knocked on the door of the apartment slash liquor store, and the door opened, I was staring in the face of the biggest gang member I'd ever seen in my life. He looked down at me, and then I looked up at him, and then I looked up at God, and I said, God, I've always heard there's a place called heaven. Save me a place. I'm coming home real soon. I mean, he has so many tattoos that if he flexed his left bicep, the Old Testament would come out, and the New Testament over here. And he looked at me, and he said, what do you want? I said, I'm the new pastor. I just want you to know that I'm here to pray for you and I have some money to give to the family, you know, for a funeral or for whatever you would need. I just want to give him the money. And he looked down at me and he said, all right, Padre, we'll make it quick. He said, did you correct him when he called you Padre? No way. When you're that big, you can call me Padre, Rabbi, Bishop, whatever you want to call me. Just don't kill me, right? And so I took that money. I'm walking in and I gave the money to the mother. She was grieving her son and it was just pandemonium everywhere. And uh, as I gave her the money, I, 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 she was so kind. She was just like, oh, thank you so much. She kept calling me Padre and, uh, and I gave her the money and I'm heading towards the door. Now, I'm walking fast towards the door because I want to get out of there. I'm not like a man by the name of David Wilkerson. You remember David Wilkerson, the, the story of the cross and the switchblade and this pastor that was so crazy that he used to talk to gang members and say, if you chop me up, every piece of me will tell you that Jesus loves you. That's not me. I'm giving her the money. I'm out the door. As I'm getting closer to the door, a hand grabbed me and spun me around. And again, I'm staring in the face of this gang member. He said, Padre, before you leave, I want you to do something. I said, brother, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll rub your back. I'll rub your feet. I'll order you a beer next door, whatever. Just don't kill me. Oh, don't look at me spiritual like that. If you have been in my situation, you would have done whatever you have to do to stay alive. Do what you got to do to stay alive. Jeremiah 173, verse 14. No, it's not in there. But anyways, he asked me to come and stay and pray for the family. I didn't know what to do. I just left Bible college early. I didn't know how to pray. I mean, they didn't prepare me for gang ministry 101 or drive-by shooting 102. That was in the curriculum, right? So I got together in a circle, and all these gang members are there, and uh, they asked me to pray for the mother and the family. So I'm just gathered around, and I learned a little prayer in Bible college called Prayer of Need in Time of Comfort. What is it? It's an autopilot Christian prayer that you can pray that will get you out of any situation. It's one of those prayers that are so general that if you prayed it, you can get out of anything, right? And so I just gathered together. I'm like, Lord, just may I just survive this prayer. It's all I ask is that I'll get out of this. And I begin to pray my, my prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bless this habitation with your glorification. And may your manifestation be here during this presentation, O oh God, of great sensation. I pray that you'll bless the birds and the trees and the flowers and the leaves as they're shaking pretty, please. I'm like rhyming, you know. I'm like flowery, memorized uh, book type of prayer. And, uh, and right in the middle of my prayer, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, you will never get this opportunity on your first day. Look what I've given you. You will never get this opportunity again. Pray like you really mean it. I said, okay, God. I said, Lord, I pray that because of hearts that are being changed today, that peace will prevail in this neighborhood. Nothing happens, so I prayed a little bolder. I said, God, I pray that these young men would realize that they're not as strong as they think they are, and they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And right when I said those words, strong as they think they are, my right hand got squeezed next to me tighter, and then my left hand got squeezed next to me tighter. I said, oh, God, he hates my prayer. I'm going down. But if I'm going out, I might as well get my name into the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Well, I just continued on to preach my prayer, you know. And right in the middle of my prayer, I was, I, was, uh, I was calling out basically salvation in the middle of my prayer. Have you ever stepped out in faith and you only had like 1% of faith and, uh, and you just gave it to God and God said, that's good enough. I'll take it. I'll use it. That was pretty much my situation right there. And I said, if anyone wants to get saved, just a suggestion, you know, just raise your hands in the air. And I looked to my right, totally not expecting this to happen. And my right hand was lifted. And then my left hand was lifted. And I looked around in that circle, and every single one of those men raised their hand, and they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, operating on 1% of faith, basically. But it was enough to please God. And it was that day where every one of them gave their life to Jesus, and I had the best bodyguards after that. My car never got broken into. 
I mean, I go across the street to that liquor store to get me a 40 ounce soda, not the other 40, 40 ounce soda. And, and I would walk in, the man would be like, hola, padre. I'm like, I'm not the padre, I'm the pastor. He said, you're the padre. And the padre gets all the free food and drinks that he wants. I said, did you say free food and free drinks? He said, yes, I did. I said, bless you, my son, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You know, I'm throwing holy water on everything on the brother. Don't let titles get in the way of free food. Jeremiah 194, verse 17. You're like, I've never read that before. And, uh, and so all those guys in that area became my friends, and God began to move. And I began to see things happen in the community. I began to see a ministry begin to rebuild. I saw my heart rebuilt lives rebuilt, situations, dreams in my heart that I never even knew that I had. The greatest thing about serving others Refuge Church is what happens is when you serve others, it not only helps other people, but it allows dreams in you to come out that you never knew that you had before. See, the issue is not the dreams that you dream from the mountaintop. It's the dreams that get revealed through rock bottom that only trials can create, that only struggles that can create. The only messy situations can create. And God is about to recreate something in you through rock bottom today. Never in my life did I dream that I would run a ministry housing hundreds of people. That was never in the plan. That, wasn't, that was not in my perfect plan. It was in my rock bottom plan. But can I tell you, in rock bottom is where God does his greatest work. The Dream Center and all the things that are happening today and the Thousands of people are being fed a week and the hundreds of people that are being sheltered every single day. None of that would have happened if everything would have gone according to plan. It happened because of the beauty of rock bottom. It's a chance that you have to go where God can take something from the beginning and rebuild it his way. Why don't you take the broken pieces that you have left, maybe the ashes that you have left, and say, God, it might not be much, but it's in your hands. And when it's in your hands, it's in your heart. And things that come out of your heart are the most beautiful expressions of grace and joy and are a gift to the world. Be that gift. Give him whatever you have left, Refuge Church, because God has the ability to take anything that you have and turn it around into something incredible. If you're listening to this sermon today and all you have left to give God is, is rock bottom and you're in a place of rock bottom, but today you want to give your life to Christ. You want to know Christ is your Lord and Savior. And you'll say, wow, nobody wants my rock bottom. Even my own family doesn't want that place in my life. They don't want the ashes, but God wants all the places that nobody else wants. I want this Savior to recreate me today. I want to know Christ is my Lord and Savior Today, now is the time. God sent me right here into your living room to tell you your life is not over. Your life can actually just start now by letting God do his greatest miracles in rock bottom. If you want to know Christ today, repeat these words after me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross that I will be saved. I repent of my sin and I give you my life. You died for me. Now I live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, Refuge Church, and I'm so proud of you and all those who made a decision to follow Christ. Keep going. Keep serving people. Keep loving people. Don't ever let the world tell you that you are not essential. You are an essential service to your community and continue to be the beautiful light that you are in serving your great city. God bless you, and I love you. Man, what an incredible message for those who are at rock bottom or you may find yourself at rock bottom in the future. I pray that you'd never forget that message. Know today, Refuge, that God is for you, God is with you, and he will take all things that the enemy meant for evil and work it together for your good in Jesus' name. I want you to go to our social media pages and thank Pastor Matthew Burnett for that incredible message incredible, life-giving message. Church, we love you and we're praying for you. We hope to see you soon. God bless and much love.